I give salam to my people in Bangkok. The lifestyle of the Prophet ﷺ was one of simplicity, it was one of asceticism, it was one that couldn't have been self serving to uh, his mission. By the time the Prophet ﷺ passed away, the majority of the Arabian Peninsula was under his control, it was under the control of Islam, but yet that did not reflect on his personal richness or his personal uh, luxury. Uh, which is the opposite of what we find today and the opposite of generally what we find with statesmen and with governors uh, and those who control uh, the authority uh, or those that have the authority in the land. Rather we find that Prophet ﷺ was such that when he would sneak the palm tree mattress that he would be lying on would leave marks on his side Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu once he entered upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he said ma hadha ya Rasul he said what is this O Masjid of Allah why is it that you have he said that the kings in the Byzantine kings uh, and Caesar uh, the kings of the, of the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire they have thrones and they have richness and luxury that they control but why is it you do not have anything like this although you could have it if you want to and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said Mali wali dunya Mali wali dunya what do I have what is my connection to this dunya me and this dunya we are separate indeed my example is the example of someone who is merely traversing on a journey and he stops temporarily under a tree to seek shade and to rest for a moment and then he'll get up and continue his journey many months would go by and the fire would not even be lit in his household in order to cook uh, many times he would leave his house out of severe hunger subhanallah and he would meet the sahaba on you know Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar and other sahaba and they would also be in a similar situation but yet the Arabian Peninsula was under his control وسلم, at the end of his life when he wished to prostrate if you see the, 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 the mock-ups of his room subhanallah you can see how small it was that he would even tap Aisha radiallahu anha she would move her legs and then he would fall into sujood it was a life of simplicity subhanallah a life of simplicity it was a, a, you know the, the main staple was al-aswadan were literally dates and water and this the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you know it's actually quite interesting because Ghazali and other ulama they actually comment and they say that subhanallah it actually goes to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have instructed Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to not live like this to live a life of luxury when the richness uh, when, when the Muslim uh, uh, became rich, when the Muslims became rich, when Islam controlled the majority of the lands of the time. But yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't. Allah jalla ala didn't. And one of the reasons that you could postulate from this was that a life of simplicity, austerity and asceticism, it actually only goes to further a person's character. And it goes to strengthen uh, the discipline that a person has and this only will shape the morality and the ethics of a person and how he's viewed by others than himself. Edward Gibbon, who was a uh, Orientalist from the 18th century, he wrote, and he was a member of parliament as well, he, he wrote and he said, the good sense of Muhammad وسلم, despised the pomp of, re of royalty. The apostle of God submitted to the menial offices of family. He kindled the fire, he swept the floor, he milked the ooze, and mended with his own hands his shoes and garments. Disdaining the penance and merit of a hermit, he observed without effort or vanity the abstemious diet of an Arab. In other words, Al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't just endure, endure the, the coarseness of his life, of, of, um, of, of a life of austerity, okay? But it flowed naturally from him. It was natural within him. And it came naturally from him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Gibbons continues and he says, On solemn occasions, he feasted his companions with rustic and hospitable plenty. But in his domestic life, many weeks would pass without a fire being kindled on the hearth of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to Washington Irving, Irving according to Washington Irving, uh, in his American, uh, American biographer and his and diplomat, he said he was sober and abstemious in his diet and a rigor observer of fasts. He indulged in no magnificence of apparel, the ostentation of a petty mind. Neither was his simplicity in dress affected, but a result of real disregard for distinction from so trivial a source. 
his military triumphs awaken no pride or vainglory, as they would have done had they been affected for selfish purposes. In the time of his greatest power, he maintained the same simplicity of manners and appearance as in the days of his adversity. So far from an affecting, so far from affecting a regal state, he was displeased if, on entering the room, any unusual testimonials of respect were shown to him. Subhanallah. It's like these people, they have a deeper understanding of the character of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than we do, subhanAllah. Take for example, um, Boswell Smith. He was, a, he was a reverend and an author and he wrote and he said, Head, head of state as well as the church, he was Caesar and Pope in one, but he was Pope without the Pope's pretentiousness or pretensions. And Caesar without the legions of Caesar, without a standing army, without a bodyguard, nor a police force, without a fixed revenue. If ever a man ruled by a right divine, it was Muhammad. For he had all the powers without their supports. He cared not for the dressings of power. The simplicity of his private life was in keeping with his public life. You see, brothers and sisters, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't live a life of austerity and a life of asceticism to earn praise from the people, nor was it, um, you know, uh, to encourage this type of monkhood or self-deprivation and the like, but it was something that flew quite naturally from him. And it serves as an example for us to see with this dunya all around us that whatever we have in this dunya, whatever is in our hands, it should not enter into our hearts. That really is the definition and the best definition given of asceticism or zuhd, as it's known in the Arabic language, which is to have something in your hand, but to not let, let it dictate the confines of your heart and to keep it separate from that. And we learn this from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mali wa dunya, what is the connection I have with the dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to all that is good. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.